from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> steadfast courage of your servant Holly Murray, who fought long and well. Unshackle us from bonds of prejudice and fear, so that we show forth your reconciling love and true freedom, which you revealed through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. reading from Galatians. For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Then Jesus began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent another slave to them. This one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, and that one they killed. And so it was with many others. Some they beat and others they killed. He still had one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. When they realized what he had told, that he had told them this parable against them, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd, so they left him and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you, Lord Christ. It was 1935, and she was on her way to the New York Public Library. She was not going to look at legal texts, although she was going to become one of the great legal scholars of the 20th century. She was not going to look for theological texts, even though she was going to be the first woman ordained in the Episcopal Church. She was going to do research about her gender and sexuality. Pauline Murray was trying to understand herself, and as a budding scholar, she decided the library was the place to go. Her sexual orientation was toward other women, and her gender identity, as far as she could tell, was male. At that point, there was not a lot of To or find a community of conversation for others who were experiencing these same things. Holly Murray did not write about this in her memoir. She gives one paragraph to her love life and her uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. Again, she wouldn't have even had those categories. We're not discussed at all. But in her letters and journals, that have now come down for biography about and discussed and made sense of, we read a lot about her struggles. In her journal, she describes herself as a boy girl, which is what her Aunt Pauline called her and which she just took up at her own description. She describes herself as in between male and female. And then trying to find the right language, she says, maybe she has a male head and brain Question mark, femaleish body, mixed emotional characteristics, borderline marginal type. She describes one of nature's experiences, a girl who should have been a boy. Using some of the scientific language of her day, she says, uh, perhaps she is a pseudo-hermaphrodite with secreted male genitals. She went in for uh, to have her appendix removed, and when she did so, she took the opportunity to ask the doctor while we're in there, see if there are male genitals inside me. She 
She described her experience of this as producing inner conflicts and terror. When she was 15 years old, she uh, decided no longer to use the name she was given, Anna, and decided to try on some different names. Um, first she thought Paul, and then perhaps Peter, and then Dude. Uh, she ended up with Paul, and that was the name she went by for the rest of her life. She tried to get hormones to, uh, to uh, sort of bring out the masculinity that she felt within herself, but at that time, that was not possible for her. So today, we would describe this level of gender incongruity as transgender, not language that would have been uh, open to her at the time. So it's a bit anachronistic to try to go back and apply today's terms. Uh, but her description sounds a lot like what we would refer to with that term. And her description of inner conflicts and terror sounds a lot like what we would call gender dysphoria. Today, we are more likely to see Caitlyn Jenner or Lorraine Cox gender identity. But it's important and helpful to remember that there are others and that Pauline Murray can be for us also a face of gender uh, incongruity or transgender identity. We rightly celebrate Pauline Murray's work on behalf of civil rights, on behalf of women's rights. She was a trailblazing priest. But we can also celebrate the fact that she did these things even as she was trying to find comfort in her own skin. At three years old, her mother died. Her father didn't feel like he could take care of her, so she went to live with her aunt Pauline in Durham, North Carolina, and began to attend St. Titus Episcopal Church. Her father uh, was beaten to death in a racial incident when she was 12. And she and her aunt Pauline then uh, made a family. And she was a great student. She set her eyes on Columbia University only to find that Columbia University did not accept women. And Barnard, the partner institution, was too expensive. She struggled again and again to find a place that were, would accept her. She, uh, at one point, applied to Harvard and found out Harvard also did not accept women. She applied to UNC Chapel Hill and found out that UNC does not accept African Americans. One door after another, after another was closed to her. She finally uh, went to Howard University for her law degree, a place where her race was not an issue, but her was. And she was excluded and discriminated against as a woman uh, among a student body in the law school that was entirely male and a faculty that was entirely male. She referred to this experience as an experience of Jane Crow. She did finally earn her law degree, and she became the first doctor of jurisprudence, uh, the first African American doctor of jurisprudence at Yale University. She had uh, friendships and people she impacted profoundly. Uh, she was friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt called her a firebrand. Her legal work impacted um, Thurgood Marshall, as well as Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Finally, she made her way through a profound law career to a place as a tenured professor at Brandeis University, only to discover at age 63 that she had a calling to the ministry. <laughs> and true to Pauline Murray's style, uh, she was not going to be held back by the fact that her own Episcopal Church did not ordain women. And so before the church ever ordained women, she took off and began seminary at uh, General in New York. She did her studies without any uh, sense of whether she would be able to be ordained. She completed her studies in 1976 at 66 years old. And on January 1st, 1977, the Episcopal Church ordained, uh, the Episcopal Church for the first time uh, made ordination of women a possibility. On January 8th, 8th of 1977, Mary <coughs> was ordained as the first African American woman in the Episcopal Church. 
Holly Murray was in some ways the poster child of Galatians 3.28. There is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Now, Galatians 3.28 has to be understood in light of Galatians 3.27. This is a baptismal claim that Paul is making, right? In 3.27, he says, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself in Christ. Right? So the breaking down of these distinctions, the overthrowing of the principalities and powers of division and oppression were a result of being baptized into Christ and clothing oneself in Christ. This was made real, was made true by God's grace. Right? These distinctions are overthrown to Gentile. Uh, slave free, male, female, to the extent that these distinctions produce hierarchies and oppressions, these have been overthrown in Christ. That's true, and that's the work of God's grace. And for these things to become real on the ground involves our cooperating with God's grace. God makes it true, we cooperate to help make it. And that's what Pauline Murray's work was, to make real this reality that she knew to be true in her own baptismal life, that she knew to be true of the God who made her and came to be among us as Jesus. But there's that particular phrase, no longer male and female. Now, in one sense, this corresponded precisely to so much of the work that Pauline Murray did. Um, working for the equality of the sexes, and this is where she worked closely with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. This is crucial work. And no longer male and female meant that men and women were going to be equal before the law. That there would be no discrimination on the basis of sex. Her own private life and her own experience of herself, there is no longer male and female may well have meant something else. Or at least for those of us who read this now in light of what we've come to know about her through her journals and letters. What would that have meant if there was no longer male and female? Gregory of Nyssa reads this passage as a way of saying, um, in the eschaton there will be no gender. In heaven, gender will be gone, no longer male and female. We are all moving toward a gender. Now Gregory's a minority voice. Um, right, but, but this is his way of trying to make sense of what does that mean? No longer male and female, this must be some sort of eschatological transformation that's going to happen. But there are other ways of thinking of this short of an entirely agendered or non gendered experience of the eschaton. In some way, no longer male and female does suggest that something of that division, something of that distinction, the same way that Jew and Gentile as a distinction was being broken down, the dividing wall of hostility was being broken down, somehow male and female, something about that division was being broken down. And maybe it was fundamentally the hierarchy and power that was being broken, but maybe it also had something to do with the many ways that we distinguish male and female in terms of what we can and can't do, in terms of how we can and cannot dress or present ourselves. Maybe something of that was also being broken down in Christ's work. And maybe in that way, Paul and Murray's own therapy or something that could help her express the maleness that she actually experienced internally, maybe that was something like embracing the reality that in Christ there is no male and female. Maybe some sense of fluidity emerges there where we thought there were clear binary categories. Holly Murray's public achievements are celebrated right. But her struggle with her gender identity and her sexual orientation are also part of her witness. On November 23, 2019, Dion Johnson became the first openly gay black man to be elected Bishop of the Episcopal Church. 
And in an interview, he said, it was Paul Murray who taught him, quote, to be who I am. We give thanks today for the life and witness of Paul Murray. His accomplishments as well as his struggles showed courage and perseverance and strength to stand with those who are left outside or left behind or left alone. Thank you. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name and be united in your truth live together in Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them, and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We give thanks for the students of our seminary. Bless Dakota Blackman and Daniel Crooks, and all those who study in this place. Lord, in your mercy. Here we also give thanks for all who labor to further the mission of the seminary. Bless Nancy Presto and all those who labor in this place. Lord, in your mercy. Here we are Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially Cammy. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, especially Josh and Jaden, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with them and all of your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, the giver of all good gifts, in your divine providence, you have appointed various orders in your church. Give your grace, we humbly pray, to all who are called to any office and ministry for your people. And so fill them with the truth of your doctrine and clothe them with the holiness of life, that they may faithfully serve before you, to the glory of your great name and for the benefit of your holy church. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth for the wonderful grace and virtue declared in all your saints, who have been the chosen vessels of your grace and the lights of the world in their generations. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. <laughs> Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray, you, gracious God, send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with Polly and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on it in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as the members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. 